Media coverage provided by the CyberWire. Our popular daily cybersecurity news brief and daily podcast are online at thecyberwire.com. We are able to help extend the reach of the 2017 Women in Cybersecurity Conference keynotes thanks to the generous support of our sponsors. IBM. Silence and CyberSec Jobs. Good evening. Good evening. Ah, oh, that's much better. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm very honored to have been asked to do this. Um, I was, uh, I'm a good friend of Michelle Dennity, and I really enjoyed her talk this morning, and I hope, uh, I hope to, that you'll see a few recurring themes. Um, I changed my talk a, a good bit today when I realized that th there's a large majority of students here. Okay, so a little bit about me personally. Um, I am the daughter of physicians. My brother's a physician. My grandfather was a physician. My uncle was a physician. My great uncle was a physician. Um, there's 16 physicians in my family, and oh no, but now there's two more because my niece and nephew just graduated, and I have another nephew in medical school. So I'm truly what we refer as the black sheep of the family. Um, but I first learned about privacy as a small girl when my parents had, oh thank you, thank you. Uh, when my parents had this stained glass window that had the Hippocratic Oath on it at home. And I remember my parents telling us about it and how important it is to, for physicians to maintain patient-physician confidentiality. And so the Hippocratic Oath says, whatever I see or hear in the lives of my patients, I will keep secret as considering all such things to be private. So in my family, privacy was a value and something that was uh, to be protected. Um, a little bit more about me, I married my best friend, Peter Swire, he's a professor at George Tech, and there is his picture. I am the daughter of Cuban immigrants, the proud daughter of Cuban immigrants. My parents came to this country in 1961 with $80, one suitcase, and a one-year-old baby, and they did not speak English. And we didn't have Univision, and we didn't have Telemundo, and we didn't have Goya products in the grocery stores. Um, instead, we had to drive down to Miami twice a year to buy black beans <clears throat> to get our, to stock up for the year. Um, and uh, I married an American, and I love this graphic of Cuban coffee and American coffee, because that's, that's my marriage, in a nutshell. So what's it like to grow up in a Cuban Catholic family? Um, we go to the beach every, every year, in Miami, of course, because that's where all Cubans could, went, and that was the only place we could afford to go in July, was Miami, because you know, people usually go there in January. Um, in the bottom left picture, you'll see my parents, my brother, my grandparents, and my great uncle. My grandmother and I are the only people who are not doctors in that picture, by the way. Um, my parents were very optimistic and taught us to be optimistic. And I love this quote from Winston Churchill, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. Isn't that cybersecurity in a nutshell, right? Um, my parents really taught us to see the glass half full rather than half empty, and I encourage you to, to attack everything in life in that way as well. I was raised and educated in Atlanta, Georgia. I went to public elementary school, Catholic high school. Um, I went to Mercer University for two years, majoring in secondary education, and then I changed my major to business, and then I took a programming class and fell in love with computing, and changed my major and transferred to Georgia Tech. Um, and I got all three of my degrees at Georgia Tech. So truly an Atlanta girl. My parents, as we were children, my parents really encouraged us to learn about leaders and about leadership. And they taught us to also make sure that we try to lead in whatever way we can. Remember, you know, just a really great quote is, leadership is action, not position. You don't have to be president of something to really lead. You can lead by example. And to, they also taught us about the need to give back and serve. <clears throat> and so 
Um, I don't know if any of you remember when there used to be, now, now you can watch forensic files, you know, 24 hours a day on HLN. Uh, it's a great thing to fall asleep to <clears throat> and learn about cybersecurity too, by the way. Uh, but we used to watch biography marathons because we were trying to learn more about people who really had impact. So when I was a kid, growing up in a Catholic family, we had this tension between St. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Jesuits, it's an order of priests in the Catholic Church, who, and they are considered the educators. And so there are many Jesuit universities around the world. And then, so we were supposed to do something great like St. Ignatius of Loyola. And then we were also supposed to be humble and serve the poor and those in need, like St. Francis of Assisi. So it was a real tension in one way, because one's super humble and one was not so humble, but they both did great things and served many different ways. And so I ended up being a, becoming an educator, although I'm definitely not a Jesuit. So who were my role models growing up? <clears throat> so these are some of the people that I admired when I was growing up. Um, it's very eclectic. You'll notice there's no, no one other than Henry Ford um, is an engineer in this photo. Um, the one in the very left bottom hand corner is my mother, who I really admire tremendously, and she's a physician. And, um, and, but, but these are the women that I thought were pretty impressive, and they were leaders, and they were often the first to do things. Um, Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman uh, on, the, on the Supreme Court in the United States. Mother Teresa, serving the poor. Um, all of these people were really great communicators. And then just to give you a little sense of my values, uh, this is Teddy Roosevelt. The worst lesson that can be taught to a man is to rely upon others and to whine over his sufferings. So my parents really instilled it in us that there's nothing to be gained by just complaining about something. If you see a problem that needs to be fixed, just do something about it and fix it. Um, leadership, if you're not the lead camel, the, ne the view never changes. <clears throat> my parents had a humorous Cuban way of, of saying that too. Uh, I used to come home from school and watch Star Trek. Um, I, I really loved Captain Kirk, so I'm sorry I can't hear you over the sound of how awesome I am. Um, but this was my first introduction to technology. If you, if you think about it, you know, Dr. Bones could see, put you through this little box and suddenly, miraculously, he knew exactly what was wrong with you. And now we have an MRI, right? And so that was really my first introduction to technology um, in a medical family. Um, Leaders keep their eye on the horizon, not just on the bottom line. Leadership is not just telling people what to do, it's leading by example, and diving in and rolling up your sleeves with them. And uh, I'm a huge fan of Walt Disney. Courage is the main quality of leadership, in my opinion, no matter where it is exercised. Usually it implies some risk, especially in new undertakings. So I think of my parents leaving Cuba with nothing, um, and uh, making it to this country, and that took a lot of courage, and that courage has really inspired me throughout my life. And then many of you will remember this is a pivotal uh, moment. I wasn't alive, but this was constantly um, r resonated for, for a whole decade um, in the 60s uh, when President Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And uh, my parents really instill this in us as well. And so I had no idea how I'd ever be able to help my country um, when I was growing up. And it wasn't until grad school that I kind of figured out how I might do that. And I'm hoping I might inspire some of you today to cons consider that path. If you find a path with no obstacles, it probably doesn't lead anywhere. And I've had plenty of obstacles in my life. I'm sure many of you have too. Um, and that's OK. So my obstacles, well, Spanish was my first language. I didn't speak English until I was a little older. Um, and I'm dyslexic, and I have attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity, which makes it even more fun. Um, and I've been on Ritalin since I was 11 years old. So it took me six years to finish college. I had a tutor in all of my math, calculus, physics classes at George Tech. So that was like two and a half years of tutoring, three hours of tutoring every week, just to get through college. But I loved computing, and I was willing to do that in order to be where I am today. 
And so I hope you love it so much that you're willing to work hard at the part of it that maybe is difficult for you that you don't like um, in order to reap the benefits of all the other things that we can do in, in uh, computing and in computer security. Which brings me to persistence and perseverance. Um, I just really love this one. It's, it's over, man. Let her go. Um, so adversity. A bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the turn. And I love this. A kite rises against, not with the wind, right? So adversity is really what propels us. And so you'll face it in your life, and you should embrace it when you see it. And a smooth sea never made a skilled mariner. And then what lies behind us and what lies before us are small compared to what lies within us. And each of you has within you something really special because you're here tonight. And you're here because you care about cybersecurity. So a lot of you are probably thinking, should I go to grad school or not? Um, and so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, I loved my HCI course in, in undergrad, and my, the professor invited me to be an undergraduate research assistant. And I said, sure, money to do stuff that's kind of cool and get on-the-job experience, sir. So uh, I did work on digitizers. Like, th th Think about handwriting and character recognition on your phone. Our digitizers were like this big back then. Um, and I really enjoyed the work. They encouraged me to stay and get my master's degree. And I was like, wow, I can like, stay here and not decide what I want to be when I grow up and school's going to be free for two years? Sure. So I stayed. Um, and then I did the same for a PhD program. And each time, though, I made sure <clears throat> that I was interviewing uh, for jobs, just in case, because I'm a planner, so I always have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. Um, so why did I decide to stay each time? Well, there was someone who believed in me more than I believed in myself. Someone offered me an opportunity, and I took advantage of it. And each time, I had that plan B, right? And I, I'm a huge believer in plan Bs. Notice what I'm stressing here. Someone offered me an opportunity, and I took advantage of it. How many times have you been offered something, and because you didn't have the confidence, you said, no, I don't think so, right? You, you got to just jump for it and go for it, because don't worry about what you think you can do. If someone believes you can do it, that should propel you. And, uh, and people are usually pretty spot on when they think you can do something. They are not spot on when they think you can't do something, and we'll get to that later. Um, teachers and leaders share a trade secret that when they expect high performance of their charges, they increase the likelihood of high performance. And that's how I felt at Georgia Tech. And all these people who kept challenging me and challenging me, and I didn't think I could do it, but they all thought I could. And I was like, well, if they think I can, then I'm going to keep trying. And, uh, and so now I'm a professor, and I'm doing the same for other students. Um, I didn't particularly have a lot of great work experience as a student. Um, lab monitor, research assistant. Um, the best job I think I had was a volunteer position with the Olympics in Atlanta where I went through training for two years to be an envoy. I was the envoy for Equatorial Guinea um, during the Olympics in Atlanta and I lived in the village during the games. I learned all about hosting uh, international visitors and everything you could possibly want to know about how to qualify for every sport in the Olympics. Um, oops. Okay. And then while I was in school, um, I minored in t business and technical communication as an undergraduate. I mentioned that to you because when I was in, the first time I touched a computer, I was 18 or 19 years old. Very different for you all now today. But I looked around me and I was surrounded, I was often the only woman in my class at George Tech. There was sometimes one other woman. Guys would come up to me years later and say, oh, I had, you know, 26, 22 with you. And I'd be like, yeah, you and 100 other guys and you were all behind me. I have no idea who you are, sorry. But they all knew me because I was the only girl. Um, but what I realized is they were great at programming and I would never be able to compete with them because they had been building computers in their garage with their dads since they were kids. And, you know, I was sitting next to the guy who didn't like the way the compiler worked in the lab because it was so slow, so he'd write his own compiler to compile his program because it was faster. And I was like, really? 
like, I'd rather go dancing on Saturday night. It just didn't, it didn't do it for me. But I realized that what I had was that I could communicate better than they could and that that was going to be my competitive advantage. So as you're going through school, think about what's your competitive advantage and get a minor in it because that's going to set you apart in your ability to find a job and have a career that's very meaningful and something that you really care about and enjoy. And then when I was in grad school, I minored in management and public policy. Why management? Well, my parents remember they want us to be leaders. And public policy because I got interested in it and I thought, I want to have impact and maybe this is the right way to do it. And I had gone and sat in on hearings on, on the Hill in DC and I realized like, oh, I want to testify before Congress. And that's going to require me to become an expert in something. And what am I going to become an expert in? And uh, it ended up being privacy and security. So I've worked with a lot of different companies as consultant, doing research with them um, and with uh, federal agencies as well. These are just some of them. Some of you may recognize some of these. Um, I've also served on national boards. <clears throat> and um, in 2005 and 2006, I was selected for something called the Defense Science Study Group that's funded by, um, by DARPA, where they take mid-career faculty um, in science, in all areas of science and engineering, and they expose you to problems within the Department of Defense um, for two years. And uh, I learned, this is, these are the fun pictures. We actually did a lot of other work, not in f such fun areas, but um, so this was where I first started thinking about national security and having impact, um, not just on you know, computer security and privacy for systems, but actually thinking on a much bigger scale. And that led to my starting to do some work um, with the NSA and the, Department, and the US Department of Homeland Security. So that's a little background. So how do you put all that together in a way that you can have impact? So there's a lot that engineers can do to shape public policy. Um, and, and this is kind of a chronology of how it all happened for me. Um, I, I, I served as a, uh, I was a distinguished lecturer at, at NSF. Um, I was on the size advisory committee at the NSF. I served on the CRA board of directors. Um, I mentioned the Defense Science Study Group. That opened doors for me to then serve on the US Department of Homeland Security's Data Privacy and Integrity Advisory Committee. Um, and then I joined US uh, ACM's Public Policy Council. Remember, I had a minor in public policy. When I was at NC State, my faculty mentor said to me once, why are you doing all this public policy stuff? Isn't this distracting you? And I said, did you look at my resume when you hired me? Because, you know, it was there, very clear, I'm going to do public policy. So <clears throat> there was skepticism about that as a, as a way of having impact, but I, th I think it's paid off and, and worked out pretty well. I've testified before Congress a couple of times. I've served on a National Research Council committee. I have these here to give you examples of things that you can do. And if you're interested in getting involved in public policy and cybersecurity and privacy, a great way to do it is as a member of USACM, and you can do that as a student. And uh, you can send me an email if you want to learn more about it. I'm happy to, to uh, connect you with, with, that, with that organization. Uh, I've given testimony on uh, privacy within the context of counterterrorism and, uh, uh, and, and the impact of technology for the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. And then this past year, um, I was appointed by President Obama to the Commission on Enhancing Cybersecurity for the Nation. I know you've all heard about imposter syndrome. Uh, you know, it just, it never, it never escapes you. So, um, you know, I went to my first meeting and I'm sitting there with the former uh, national security advisor for President Obama and it's, and, and the former CEO of IBM. And I'm just a professor in a school chair, um, but I have expertise. And so that's, that's what it all comes down to is being an expert in something and being willing to express your opinion which we'll come back to in a bit, too. And this came in the mail. This is what your kid, apparently, once you've been a commissioner, this is, uh, you get a nice commission in the mail. From, so that's really cool. So there's a bit of a roller coaster involved with all of this. Um, and so um, I thought I'd just give you a few um, thoughts. Remember what your goal is. You all want to have impact in some way on this world, on this country 
on your organization, on your university, on your company, in your neighborhood. Um, remember that and don't lose sight of it. Persevere and always remember that the rewards always outweigh the sacrifice. And there are sacrifices. When I was in school on Ritalin, my friends would all want to go eat pizza. And they'd leave all their books in the library with me because I had like 20 more minutes on Ritalin or, or an hour or more and I was not going to lose one minute of the time that I had on medication. And so I couldn't be spontaneous in college the way a lot of other people were, and that was my big sacrifice, but it totally paid off. Don't, never compare yourself to others. Uh, you have to recognize that luck sometimes has a role in your success. We all have papers that are rejected when we submit them. Uh, we all t attempt things that we, don't, um, that we don't succeed at. But if you don't try, you'll never know. And if you don't succeed at first, then try and try again. Avoid negative people. They will drag you down. Um, positive people attract and negative people repel. And you want to be around positive people who are going to prop you up and challenge you. Um, pe pick people who will push you um, to work. Take care of yourself. Be balanced. Um, focus on the positive. Keep working. Work really hard. Work harder than everyone around you. Um, Unfortunately, as women, we really actually have to do that. Um, don't become complacent when you've had a string of successes. Uh, some people will like kick back, oh, I'm being successful, and then psh, things, things trail off. So don't let that happen to you. Um, get involved, become a leader, make a difference, um, get involved in service, and then make friends and network and have fun. I hope you're doing a lot of that here. Um, some more specific education, uh, uh, education related advice. I can't help it, I'm a professor. We advise students, uh, we love it. That's, 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 that's what we love to do and what they pay us for. There's no such thing as too much education. So if you're even thinking about it, just do it. Go, get more education. It, it will only open doors for you later. Be a leader of something, um, anything. Because the more times that you give yourself the opportunity to develop skills that, that, that help you to lead and to communicate and to make a difference, the better you'll be as a person and in life and the better you'll, that will translate to your technical contributions as well. Give back to your community. When you see a problem, don't just sit back. Don't be apathetic. Don't say, oh, that's a shame. Like, try to do something about it. And if you don't know how to do something about it, hook up with people who maybe do and maybe you can inspire them to solve the problem. Um, don't ever believe anyone who says you can't do something. My parents were told that I would not go to college. My parents were told I was too social, which is true, um, and too lazy. It wasn't that I was lazy, it was that I had ADHD, and so I couldn't focus. Um, I'd really love to go back now and tell all those teachers who said I'd never go to college that not only I'd go to college, but I'm teaching college. Um, but anyway. Um, and uh, try to be a founder of something. It can be something as simple as a mentoring program at your school, um, or a lunch, a brown bag at, at a lunch for your company that focuses on specific topics. Uh, and you have people present different topics that will help you become better and be, work on your professional development. Those things make a big difference. And I mentioned become an expert. Find something that you're really passionate about with cybersecurity. For me, it happens to be, how do we get software systems to comply with federal privacy and security regulations? And that's really driven a lot of what I do with respect to service, with respect to consulting, with respect to the teaching I do, and with respect to the research I do. And I absolutely love it. So um, that has enabled me to do things like testify before Congress and to inspire other students to study this problem, which is so important and which we have so few people who really understand it. And then just to put a feminine thing, uh, spin on things, because, you know, I, I like that. Albert Einstein said, the woman who follows the crowd will usually go no further than the crowd. The woman who walks alone is likely to find herself in places no one has ever been before. I have many times been the only woman in the room. It's something that, unfortunately, I've been quite comfortable with. Um, my brother's six and a half years older than me. I was the only 
girl in the neighborhood. Um, I was the only girl in my class at Georgia Tech often, um, and I've sometimes been the only woman on the board in the boardroom. Um, and uh, but you know, if I followed people, I never would have gotten to where I am. And for every step that every door I've opened, there's been a million women who've gone before me and opened doors for me as well. And so remember that as you start your careers. Behind every successful woman is a tribe of other successful women who have her back. Right. Anne Hathaway said, a man told me that for a woman, I was very opinionated. I said, for a man, you're kind of ignorant. <laughs> I've been told I'm opinionated very often throughout my life. I hope that someday you each have an opportunity to hear Ursula Burns speak. She is one of the most inspiring women that I've come across in my career. She's the CEO of Xerox. Um, she had a very, very um, challenging childhood and, uh, and, and is just this woman who really kicks you know what. And, uh, and she's a technologist and an engineer. She says, I didn't learn to be quiet when I had an opinion. The reason they knew who I was is because I told them. So don't be scared to express your opinion. Shale Sandberg, I want every little girl who's told she's bossy to be told instead that she has leadership skills. Margaret Thatcher, being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, then you aren't. And Madeleine Albright, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. And Mother Teresa, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. And all of you who are students, you are the stones of all of your professors. And we are casting you out into the world, and you are rippling. And you, are having a, and you will have the impact on cybersecurity for our, our, our uh, world um, that we expect of you. And we can only imagine what you all will accomplish. Be fearless, we saw that this morning. Um, set really high goals for yourself. This is me at Mount Everest Base Camp. Um, I'm not, a, I'd never done anything this crazy before, but I trained for it and I accomplished it and I was running a fever and I made it anyway because I'm really stubborn and I'm persistent and I persevered. And uh, also Mount Kilimanjaro uh, this past year with my husband. So set your goals high, work hard to achieve them, um, and really strive to have impact because we really need a lot of great computer security professionals um, in the world today. Thank you.